We are continuing our Thanksgiving series, um, and I'm sure you would agree with me when I say that there are so many things that we have to be thankful for in this life, aren't there? So, so many things, especially as Christians, friends, especially as God's children. There is so much that we have to be thankful for. The purpose of this series is to challenge each of us to really reflect on those things and how they should impact our lives and how we reflect that gratitude, that thankfulness in the world and, and in those around us in our, our life. Last week, Brother Gordon, he um, did a great job showing us that the hope that we have in Jesus, the hope that is available to all who would receive him, and it is a certain promise that the hope that we have in Jesus and that we have that eternal life waiting on us for those who have received him as Savior. Amen? Amen. So he did a great job. And so this morning I want to turn your attention to the magnificence, the absolute magnificence of God's forgiveness and God's mercy this morning. I would say that this is one of the top things that Christians have to be thankful for is forgiveness and mercy. So would you join me this morning in turning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. Now, we're going to spend our time here in this parable that we're going to read, um, but we're not going to spend all of our time there. We're going to be looking at several different scriptures that, that exude this theme of being thankful for God's forgiveness and his mercy. We're going to begin in verse 23 in just a moment. A little bit about this parable. This parable is actually given in response to Peter's question to Jesus when Peter asked Jesus, How many times should I forgive a brother who sins against me? And so Jesus gives this response in form of a parable. Now you may wonder at first, Why have I decided to go to this parable? I am confident that by the end of our time this morning, you'll see. Um, that it will be pulled together and why we're going to be in Matthew 18 this morning. So let's look at Jesus' response as he tells his followers this parable. Verse 23, he says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. I'm going to stop there for a moment because what I would like to do is to paint this picture that Jesus is painting here in this parable, this picture of this heavy debt this heavy debt that this servant in this parable owed. How many talents did he owe? 10,000, right? We just read that. He owed 10,000 talents. <clears throat> and if you don't know what a talent is, it is the largest denomination of money in the Roman world at that time. A biblical talent, listen to this, was enough money that a man who owned just one coin would be considered rich just by owning one coin. To bring it into perspective, one talent is equal to 6,000 denarii. What on earth is a denarii, right? Is he speaking in tongues this morning? No. A denarii, a denarius, was a standard silver Roman coin that a, a general ordinary laborer, much like you and I, would make in a day. We would make one of those, um, and that would be um, our wages for the day. Now, if one denarius was what a man like this ungrateful servant could earn in one day, he would need to work 6,000 days to earn one talent. Think about that for a minute. That's 16 years that this servant would have to work to just pay back one single talent. It's a long time, right? How many talents did he owe? 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents would equal 60 million denarii or approximately 60 million days of work. Sorry, no retirement for you, <laughs> right? You wouldn't even live that long. It was an astronomical amount of money, right? Astronomical. It was an unforgivable debt. This debt was life-crushing to this servant. Now, Jesus was being intentional, wasn't he? 
He was being intentional in this parable to grab the listener's attention, to bring them in, for them to understand the weight of this servant, the debt that he owed. Now, Justin, why on earth are you starting here? Why are you starting by talking about this parable and this great debt? And you all ask the best questions. (laughs) All right? In order to grasp the magnificence this morning, the magnificence of God's grace, His forgiveness, His mercy, we have to understand the picture that Jesus just painted. Who do you believe the servant is in this parable? Us. Us. Two audiences here. So, first... The servant, in context, is the disciples. It is a child of God. Now, if you are a Christian this morning, meaning that you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you are following him, he is the Lord of your life, the servant is who you were before Christ. The unsaved, if you don't know Jesus, you've never um, bowed to him as Lord and received his free grace, this is where you stand now. And so just like the servant, we have an astronomical debt, a life-crushing debt, a debt that is unable to be paid in and of our own ability. The only difference is instead of talents, it's sin. Instead of talents, our debt is sin. And to build the weight of that, we can look all throughout Scripture from beginning to end, can't we? In the beginning, God created everything. He created time. He created space. He created man and he created woman to reflect his image and he made them in his likeness to reflect his glory. And we know it didn't last very long, right? A couple of chapters and we meet the the devil in the form of a serpent and what does he do? He just comes in and tempts Eve and she trusts her own thinking and her own logic and in turn Adam also gives in and before we know it, sin entered the world because man trusted themselves and their own logic rather than God. And fast forward to the New Testament and what Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 5. He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans chapter 3, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a footnote in your Bible that says that has a list of exceptions. I would like to believe, and I I joke about this quite a bit, that my mother-in-law, I could almost imagine that she would be in the list of exceptions, but she's just not. When I think of a godly woman who I know is praying for me, who it's hard for me to see Esther Cardenas on that list, but she is. We all are. Every single human being on the face of this earth cannot escape the weight of sin. That is what we are born into. That is very much who we were apart from Jesus. And if we don't know him, that's who we are now. And earlier in chapter 3 in Romans, Paul says, and he's mirroring Psalm 14, he says, none is righteous, no, not one. He says, no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together, they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one, Paul writes. In Isaiah 64, 6, I love how the NLT renders this verse. Listen to this. We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags, Isaiah says. You see, when we think of sin, we think in the extreme, don't we? Well, at least I haven't murdered anybody, right? Or at least I haven't committed adultery, right? We think in the extremes. But according to Isaiah and according to the Bible, we don't categorize sin, but if you wanted to put it that way, even the smallest sin that you would think is not even important is still sin. No amount of good that we can do can escape the fact that it is tainted by sin. We may be an upstanding citizen. We may give back to our community and to man's perspective. We may honestly be a good person according to the world's standards. But according to Scripture, when we read it, we read that all of our good deeds are but filthy rags. Why? Because we are sinners. We were born into this world as sinners. And so we can't bring anything to God that's going to impress Him or that's going to please Him. We read even in the Old Testament in Habakkuk 1.13 that God's eyes are too pure to approve evil. Too pure to approve evil. And He cannot look on wickedness with favor. Do you feel the weight 
of that? Do you feel it? One step farther in Revelation 21, speaking of heaven, nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So apart from Christ, we are unclean and unqualified to enter heaven. Why? Because of our sin. No amount of good that we can do is going to grant us access into heaven apart from Jesus. We're not going to find another way to figure it out on our own. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. The payment of sin is death. Look at verse 25 again in this parable with me. <laughs> After receiving the news, I mean, he owes 10,000 talents. That's a life sentence, folks. In verse 25, he says, And since he could not pay, how could he? Such a big debt. His master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. And we read that the servant fell on his knees imploring him, Forgive me, have patience with me, and I will pay you back. What we see in verse 25 is justice. The justice of the king here. He ordered the servant and his family into slavery. Now, at first glance... That may seem like the king is being unfair or that the king is being unjust. You know he can't pay this debt back, but you're, you're ordering this. The king is well within his right to order such this order right here for it to be paid. Justice demands satisfaction. Payment has to be made. And in the same way, don't miss this this morning, in the same way God executes justice, sin has to be paid for. It comes at a cost. Sin has to be paid for. Apart from God, a person will experience his wrath, and rightly so. And I'm afraid in churches today, we're not teaching that enough. We're not teaching what it means for God to execute his justice. God isn't an unloving or an unfair God. We're going to see in a moment that God is loving. God stands ready to forgive. God has done all of the work, but sin has to be paid for. And God is just in sending a sinner to hell. Do you realize that? Because they sinned against a holy God. Sin requires punishment. It requires payment. It requires satisfaction. Whose satisfaction? The one in whom it was offended, was, the, was offended, and that is God. Because God is holy. God is just. We deserve his wrath and justice. But the beautiful picture is this. God so loved the world. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but what? Have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Look in verse 27. And out of pity for him, the servant, the master of the servant, released him and forgave him the debt. The debt of 10,000 talents in this parable. And we just read of what that meant earlier, how significant that debt was. And the king erased it all, not part of it, all of it. It's not like the student loan forgiveness plan. You can only get $10,000 of your student's loans forgiven, right? No, this is total forgiveness wiped away, wiped away. I see some of you laughing. Maybe I stepped over. Ooh, make me a little note in here. Be careful next time you say that. But it's true. Not partial, total forgiveness. The king had compassion. He released him, he forgave. Listen, through love, the king extended grace. He gave the servant what he didn't deserve, which was mercy and forgiveness. Through God's love, friends, a person can receive mercy and forgiveness. It is by his grace. God's grace is something we don't deserve. And Forgiveness and mercy is motivated by God's love. It's his love in action. And he demonstrated his love by sending Jesus for you and for me. And he didn't have to do that, but he did. Why? Because God so loved the world. He made a way where there was no way because we couldn't find it on our own. I love, I love the Bible. It just, it's the best commentary for itself when you want to look at God's character. And let's think of this forgiveness. Let's, Nehemiah 9.17 is one of my favorite passages. All the Bible is my favorite passage, right? It should be for all of us. But I love what Nehemiah says. He says in 9.17, you are a God ready to forgive. 
He says, you are a God that is ready to forgive. You're gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And likewise, Daniel 9, what does Daniel say? He says, to God, the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. And the psalmist declares in Psalm 86, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Isaiah 1. We're all familiar with this one. Isaiah 1.18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Amen? Isaiah 43. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins, God says. Isaiah 55, 6 through 7. Seek the Lord, Isaiah says. Seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And listen to this. It's beautiful. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon not partially pardon. God will abundantly pardon and forgive you of your sin. How does God do this? He accomplished it through His Son. He accomplished it through Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is one of my favorite verses. For our sake, our sake, He, God, made Him, Jesus, to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That is the gospel in one verse. He made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that you and so that I can become the righteousness of God. I love Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going all over the place. It's a lot of scripture. People will tell you, don't, use t- <laughs> don't overwhelm people with scripture, but I believe the opposite. Scripture is powerful. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. I chose to use the NLT's rendering of this. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God purchased his freedom. How? With what? The blood of Jesus. And he forgave our sins. Do you remember what I said just a short time earlier? Justice demands what? Justice demands satisfaction. Christ had to make full satisfaction for our sins before he could forgive them. Think about that for a second. Jesus had to make full satisfaction for our sins before they could be forgiven. If there was no Christ, if there was no Jesus, every single person on the face of this earth would have no hope. They wouldn't. There would be no hope. Man would be left in their sin to fend for themselves. And we already know what the Bible said. No one is good. No one seeks after God. Christ had to make full satisfaction. He came to this earth to do what we couldn't do, friends, to live perfectly. He came to live without sinning. He fulfilled every prophecy, did he not? He fulfilled every single prophecy to the T and yet was without sin. (laughs) Kept all aspects of the law. And you know what he did? Jesus willingly went to the cross. I don't know if enough people recognize this or not, and some of our younger folks may not, that Jesus could have bypassed death altogether. He could have went straight to heaven to be with the Father because he didn't sin. And we know that heaven can't have anything unclean in it. Jesus wasn't unclean. He was clean. He was holy. He was pure. He was sinless. He could have bypassed death altogether, but he chose the cross. He chose the nails, and he did that for you, and he did it for me so that you would have the opportunity to have your slate clean and to be forgiven. He made a great transaction on that day. When Jesus went to the cross, he took his, his, not ours, He took his perfection and he traded it for our imperfection. His righteousness for our unrighteousness. And what did he do? He took your sin 
nailed it on the cross. He took your sin and buried it in the grave and rose from the dead. That is why a person can be raised from death to life. God's wrath was poured out on his son on the cross in the person of Jesus. Jesus took our sin. He buried it. God's wrath was satisfied. And how do we know that God's wrath was satisfied? How, that God was pleased with what Jesus did because of the resurrection. That is how we know that God was pleased with Jesus' work on the cross. And he conquered the two greatest enemies in your life, sin and death. He conquered sin and he conquered death, and that is why the devil and the demons tremble at the name of Christ. They tremble. Why do you think it is that when a person becomes a Christian that the heat intensifies, that it gets more difficult? Because the moment we become Christians, we have a target on our back. We are forgiven. We are a new creation in Christ. We have been set free. We're not in bondage from our sin. Amen? Amen. Because of what? Because I accepted Jesus? Because I asked him to forgive me? Because I? No. If somebody ever asks you, why are you going to heaven? What is the reason for your hope? Never, ever start it in the first person. Well, it was because I accepted Christ. It was because I did this. It was because I did that. No, it is because he did it. It is because Christ accomplished what was possible for you on the cross. All you did was bow the knee and and accept him as Lord. He did the work. All that was necessary to make salvation a reality for you. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above Every name, so that at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee shall bow, not just in heaven, but on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Philippians chapter 2. This is why Paul could say in Colossians, a passage that uh, Brother Gordon in the earlier part of that scripture he read, this is why Paul could say that we're to give thanks to God the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We were once unclean and unqualified, but because of Jesus, we are now clean and qualified to enter heaven. Now, forgiveness, I love this, forgiveness, simply put, is God's promise not to count your sins against you. Think about that for a moment. Think about your life. I don't know, I know my life, and I know the mistakes, or I say mistakes, shame on me, sin, that I've committed in my life. Think about your life. Jesus doesn't count your sins against you. That is God's promise. God forgives you completely and totally upon the moment of your salvation. It is instantaneous. It is immediate that he forgives your sin past, present, and he forgives your sin, the future sin. What does the psalmist declare in Psalm 103? He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. He has cast them away. He remembers them no more. What is our response to such grace? What's our response to such forgiveness, such mercy from God? Look in verse 28. You would think that verse 28, what it would do is it would show a grateful and joyful servant, right? A servant that's been forgiven of 10,000 talents. But when the same servant went out, he didn't rejoice. He wasn't dancing in the streets, Paul. What did he do? He found one of his fellow servants who owned him a hundred denarii. Now remember the comparison between a denarius and talents. He owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, seizing this fellow servant, he began to choke him. What? Saying, pay what you owe me. So this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused, and he went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. 
When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So there's the full context of the passage. Jesus answering Peter. What does that have to do with anything? When we've been forgiven such a great, magnificent, or a great astronomical, life-crushing debt, we then have the ability now to extend that same forgiveness and mercy to those around us in our sphere. That's the difficult challenge of it. So how does... How do we respond to this great debt? Now, that servant could have easily paid back a hundred denarii if given time, but this ungrateful servant, he wasn't willing to do that. And Jesus was speaking in the extremes to prove a point. You've been forgiven so much. So much you've been forgiven. You've received mercy. And to extend that same forgiveness and mercy to those around you. You realize we're never more like God than when we forgive? Now we can't get into the depths of an unforgiving heart and what happens as a result of that. There's just not time to do that this morning. But you won't experience the blessings of the Christian life if you harbor that inside your heart. And that's just something to consider this morning. In closing, I want to address two groups, the only two groups here today, and I would like to ask if our praise team would come up this morning. First, I want to ask you, are you thankful this morning? Are you thankful for God's forgiveness and His mercy? That He freely gave and He lavished that upon you? So there are two, two groups this morning, and I want everybody in here to consider this. There's first the unsaved, and there is very likely someone in here this morning who doesn't know Jesus as Savior. They've never bowed to him as Lord. They've never accepted or received and trusted in him and had faith in him. Now what does Nehemiah say? God stands ready to forgive. He stands ready to forgive you. He's done all the work that's necessary and has accomplished salvation for you and for me. So what do we do? What do you do in a situation like that? If you feel the Holy Spirit calling, what do you do? You acknowledge your sin. You acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner and that you're in need of a Savior. You believe that God sent Jesus and that Jesus is God's Son and that His crucifixion, His death, His resurrection paid for your sin debt. And you confess Him as Lord of your life. You confess and you trust Him as Lord, calling upon Him for salvation. The Bible makes a promise. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, the Bible says. We also read in Romans 10, for whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Justin Coons, me, God could save me. And I look back in the life I lived, some of the things I was involved in, things I said, I did. God loves me. Yes. And God saved me. And he can save you. You have to take that step of faith and you have to receive him this morning. He can change your life forever. Forever. And you realize there may be someone here who thinks that they're a Christian and they're not. Because they've never truly repented. Turned from that life of sin and turned to Jesus. Second group. The Christians. Right? Right? Those of us, call them the seasoned saints, maybe. And here we've lived our lives. We, we believe in Jesus. But you know what? We, have, we, we make some poor choices sometimes, don't we? Right? We do. The Bible tells us where to confess those sins to Jesus. And again, in His grace and mercy, the Bible tells us that He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins if we confess them. How should this gratitude express itself? How should this thankfulness express itself? in our worship, and I'm not talking about music, in the way we live, in the way we 
adore God and revere Him, our speech, our conduct, such thankfulness should move us. It's impossible to be so thankful for God's forgiveness and yet sit on our hands and be unmoved. God moved heaven and earth in sending Jesus. Think about that. Praise Him. Worship Him. Commit your life to Him. Is there something this morning that you need or someone that you need to extend mercy or forgiveness to? Turn it over to Him. Release yourself from that hostility. Release yourself from that anger. Turn it to Christ. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Right? Yet not I, but Christ in me. I know the Spirit is at work. This morning, he's been at work all week this week in preparing for this sermon. Oh, has the enemy also been right on my heels? Right? But in this moment right now, you have a choice to make. Either for salvation or to restore the joy of your salvation this morning.